Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Ticks Season 3, Episode 13. With myself, Ryan, we got Sam and we got Jackson. Right. So this week, guys, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with everything industry. And then we're actually going to be looking at our good friend Tom Lee Rudder's film, The Bella in Witch Elm. Or oh, sorry, Bella in the Witch Elm, um, which is actually a real fantastic watch. So we're going to be discussing that and what we liked about it. And then we're actually going to be discussing a scene from Children of Men. We're actually going to be doing a new topic where every other week one of us will pick a particular scene from a particular film and then we kind of dissect it and uh, discuss exactly what we like about it or equally what we didn't like. So without further ado, over to you Sam for industry. So HBO Max will be moving forward with a Batgirl film, oh. obviously referring to Batman and not just a, a girl who's a bat. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a bat last night. Oh. They've decided, from Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> They've decided to go the directors of Bad Boys for Life, which was the Will Smith and uh, Martin Lawrence film that came out last year, which weirdly was one of the most, I think was the most successful film last year. came out in January. So it kind of, you know, it got lucky. But yeah, they've been um, attached to a lot of different projects. It's uh, Adil Albi and Bilal Falah. And um, yeah, apparently they're very dynamic directors. And I'm, uh, I read Will Smith really enjoyed working with them. So it'd be interesting to see what they do with the Batgirl story. For those who don't know who Batgirl is, Batgirl is basically Barbara Gordon, who is Commissioner Gordon's uh, Wife. daughter. Oh, daughter. <laughs> don't yeah. know your Batman. No, I don't. <laughs> he was to actually appear in uh, Ben Affleck's Batman film, but obviously that didn't happen. So it'd be interesting. The first time Batgirl's been done... And again, you can see they go over HBO Max because would it work in the cinemas? Who knows? Who knows? Talking of cinemas, cinemas are back. <laughs> Cinem <Yay>! Cinemas! <laughs> you can go and watch a film now if you want, you know? It's, uh, it's I have actually done that. Yeah, you saw Spiral I on, did. Uh, last Monday. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, they're it's all available. And I think it should be encouraged to go and see some films. Hopefully there's some good films because it's obviously a lot of deja vu from last year's films. Uh, with Quiet Place coming out and The Conjuring 3 and Fast and Furious 9. Nine. It's all like, oh, last year's films, let's catch up with those. But also they're showing older films in a lot of the cinemas. In our cinema, they're showing Taxi Driver this weekend. And I, I know, it's cool. I like it. I like that they're bringing these, these masterpieces, essentially. And to go, go back to the cinema, feel safe, it's okay. But also to try and drive up interest in cinemas, they're showing the Europa League final. For yeah, that's not interested. cool. That's terrible. <laughs> that, that shouldn't be done. I can't imagine going to a cinema and watching football. Yeah, it'd be weird, wouldn't it? Yeah. Obviously, everyone at this point has uh, been enjoying Netflix like crazy. And Zack Snyder has his new film coming out this Friday, or last Friday, because it's Sunday. Uh, Army of the Dead, his old zombie film. He's also been talking about some ideas he wants to do after that. Now, he's pretty much done with comic book movies, thank God. He wants to do a George Washington movie, but take it in a mythical kind of mystical direction. So it kind of sounds like 300, but for George Washington. Right. Do they not do something like that? I know it wasn't him, but they did something like that for Lincoln. It's like Lincoln versus vampires or something. But yeah, that was, he was a vampire hunter. That was it. And that was part of that whole kind of mixing period books or period stories in with horror. Because you have Pride Predators and Zombies and stuff like that. This sounds more like Zack Snyder wanting to do a comic book version of George Washington. Yeah. I don't know if we need films about old presidents and certain ideas that people carry out. But at the same time, I'm not American. Obviously, he'd have more of an interest in doing about the four founders or whatever they're called than, uh, than me, you know? Yeah. And there's going to be an Attack the Block sequel. Seen that. Yeah, which is pretty awesome, because the film obviously came out way back in 2011. It's actually the 10-year anniversary of it. And um, it made John Boyega's career. His and career. he's actually going back and Yeah, same director. And it's because it's been so beloved, and it was a big hit in America. Maybe not commercially, but in cult. Like, it really developed. People were buying it on DVD, and it just it carried on. And it's one of those films that people always keep going back to, of wanting him to be as good as those films. So I think it's good they're bringing it back. It's an interesting, because it's an interesting film, because it's the dynamic of like people from the streets coming and going, coming against something quite big, you know. And it's it's a, it's a great film. I love that film. It's it's incredibly entertaining. 
and now they're going to be a, on a bigger scale, which, with the right director being the first director, could work, rather than just, you know, being terrible. Upping the antes because it's a sequel for no reason, you know? Mm. Hopefully they won't fall for that. With everything that's happened culturally as well, I don't think so, because John Boyega is choosing projects that are very linked to what's going on with society in some regards. So we'll see. Back to um, more independent films. I'm going to plug some Indiegogos. The first one I'm going to plug is The Witches of Sand, which is from our very good friend Tony Marden. He's appeared in a few of our films recently. And he is one of the great extras you can see in the background of Ted Lasso. He's there doing all those things, you know. Um, part of the training team, I think. And he's in season two. But he's making a love letter to horror, The Witches of Sand, which has a stacked cast that was shooting throughout last uh, year. And he's trying to get some completion funds through Indiegogo. The, the kind of people you're going to see in that is Lynn Lowry, who's obviously from the Shivers, uh, Shivers Cronenberg's film. Lloyd Kaufman, the King of Troma. Lynn A. Quigley, who's probably pronounced wrong, but uh, the Knight of the Demon. Deborah Lamb, who's a couple of Lynch's stuff. And Michael St. Michael's The Greasy Strangler himself. The other Indiegogo I want to plug is our own Indiegogo. This is for a remake of Dustin Ferguson's Terror at Black Tree Forest. Uh, we were supposed to actually do this film last year, but then of course the pandemic happened, so we held on to it. And now we're actually ready to do it, and we need some funds to help it make it happen. We've got some awesome perks. You can get some physical media, so you can pick up the film, or you can pick up some of our older films, or My Horror Story, our show that Jack did, uh, which will have some cool, groovy extras once we sort that out. You can also pick up producer credits. You could name a character. You could buy an eyeball if you want, you know? Everything must go, and we're halfway <laughs> through there, and we could really do with your support. So please follow the link that you can see on the screen right now. And yeah, check out that. So thank you, Ryan, for that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sam, for uh, industry, bringing us up to speed. So we actually sat down and um, we watched our good friend Tom Lee Rudder's latest release. I think you can get that through Darkseid releasing? No, no. You can get that through Carney Films, through the big cartel. Um, so yeah, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. So we wanted to discuss the actual film itself. So do you guys want to start us off? Well, I think I'd like to, to start off... Uh, with a bit of a summary. Seen, um, uh, the, the, the Day of the Stranger yeah. um, before. And uh, like Tom Lee Rutter seems to have the start of this style where it's this very kind of dreamy and uh, and sort of... Uh, uh, meditative sort of imagery that really sort of draws you in and sort of takes you on a bit of a journey. It hits home, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It's it, very impactful to the eyes. Yeah. And then and he, he, he kind of um, layers that and gives it more context with the, the sound and stuff. Mm. That he's got a very good, like, um, I suppose, presentation of what is in his mind and then what comes onto the screen. There's a dedication yeah. to getting it, like, especially if it's an era piece, you know, he'll get that period piece, like, perfect. Yeah. Mm. Costume designs down to the aesthetic, everything just feels like it. And his, um, his psychedelica. Yeah. He's, he's clearly a massive, well, he is a submassive psych psychedelica fan, you can see it in all his work. <laughs> And it really does, like you say, draw you in. You're kind of watching it and it almost gives you that feeling of well, being really stoned where you're just <laughs> listening to it as you were saying. And there's one particular bit with the witches mm. and they're just dancing and they're dancing and they're dancing and then they're, stung, they're singing. Yeah. And it feels so out of context, but in the right way because you've yeah, been listening it, to mostly just this narrator. That's the thing. This, this, this film, it, it, like, it balances this, this delicate line between being, like you, like you said, a psychedelic kind of horror and a documentary that suddenly mm. will go into see, sort of these moments that feel like music videos yeah. that are almost like the music is, is just uh, something with, with the it's visuals. You know, there's, not, there's not anything like specific going on. You're just seeing things and you're being mm. drawn in emotionally. And that's the thing I think that that it, like just did so well is just take you on that emotional journey. I think with it as well, because it's, it's like um, that particular part of the film is focused around witches. It kind of adds this extra like layer of um, mystery and intrigue. Yeah. And he, I think one thing that Tom does really good in this is that whenever that bit hits, it's not a case of 
oh well witches let's quickly say about it and then dismiss it move on you, you kind of you're left with this imagery and the sounds to just play out for a period of time and it's kind of like well, okay well what happened then like and, and i know for me personally uh, i then did some research into the true story of like what <laughs> happened to so it's like i need to know and um, yeah and it, it is based on a true story and um but yeah that that one particular scene it just holds it's ground and it leaves that intrigue and it lets the, the music and um, the imagery sort of take front and center stage yeah. and captivate your mind. Well, I think that's sort of yeah, that's well done by the by that sort of first scene of like where the where the boys are going through the woods kind of thing um, and they you know you know what they're going to discover because you kind of know you the know story, where it's yeah. going. Um, but the the way that you're sort of following them deeper and deeper into the woods as they climb these sort of trees and, and sort of find these things and they're like leaning around certain places and and it just builds up that tension of like you're you're in the middle of nowhere you're you're sort of sneaking into yeah. some obscure bit of land that, that well it's private as well to. yeah they said that and that was one of the reasons that they didn't actually report the body initially mm. um which i thought was yeah again i know that that's probably like the truth of it but you add that in quite subtly again it, it adds depth to it and it, yeah. it gives you more of an understanding as to that character's motivation or lack of motivation to you know say that they discovered a body because technically they were in the wrong yeah. so and being a child like being teenagers when you're in the wrong sometimes like with your parents and stuff you wouldn't really want to own up and you know because you get yeah. told off yeah. and the thing is he really like perfectly captures that childhood anxiety of like you said thinking you've discovered something mm. and it's so well being done scarred by it yeah so i think they, they do mention that one of the boys in particular like, wasn't really the same and yeah. couldn't get rid of the imagery that he had seen it's a really weird kind of thing to keep you transfixed where you're having moments where you're like oh jesus christ that's, that's quite horrific imagery that's that's actually scary mm. and then you're kind of having a bit of humor thrown in but it's that very dark humour kind of thing because it's, it's got that, that folklore Britishness and it's, it's or impeccably British it's really it's really British mm. and it's a part of Britain that personally being you know south don't really get to see all those hills and all of the the country niceness and this it just fits so nicely it works well, yeah and it's just got this sort of classic timeless feel um, because of the because I think partly because it's it's you know been shot to sort of replicate a certain time period yeah, yeah. Of, of footage but but also because of like the, the dialogue um, from, from the narrator uh, the, no, the narrative voice basically yeah, yeah. is uh, just all of the language that it is using and the way that he's building scenes and, and sort of uh, just drawing you in with that it sort feels of rich authentic. dialogue. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and I think that's the one thing that Tom seems to always be dedicated with his films is authenticity. Not necessarily for the story to be realistic, but the format that he wants to tell it in. Mm. If he's going to give it that forties vibe, or with there the stranger trying to replicate that nineteen seventies Spanish western kind of vibe. Mm. Not Spanish, Italian westerns. <laughs> 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 Hola, amigo. Um, yeah, what I find really interesting about it is, um, you know, from watching a few different documentaries um, over the years, and especially if you go on to, like, Amazon, a lot of people can just put up any old thing, uh, like, of a documentary, and uh, I watched a, a witch one recently, and I don't know, it just, it didn't captivate me. It kind of, I lost my interest because it just, it either dwelled on something too long or it didn't give enough information about a specific thing and you're, like, left wanting more. I think where this works, where Tom's film works, is that it leaves you with enough intrigue the whole way through, but gives you the answers that, mm. you know, it, you don't feel like it's a 40 minute long like film. No. And no. with the, the way that it has that documentary kind of style to it, you're forever like, oh, that's cool. That's mm. And that's why, like, for me, it was like, oh, I need to find out what happened. And then, you know, kind of, and then you can see even more so the tender care that Tom has taken in developing the story and giving you the bits of information that you need. That's the thing. I feel like it, where it didn't present itself as a sort of direct documentary, it was much more of like a, a, a telling of the, the rumors and the, and the different stories surrounding this. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, um, and it sort of was a recreation at the same time and quite an artistic and like uh, it's like the old man in the pub. Yeah. <laughs> telling you all these tales and go, well, there's this option. And there's yeah. Yeah. Option. Yeah. 
and uh, <laughs> the I conspiracy think, nut. <laughs> I think because of that, you're not you're not ever sort of expecting it to give you all of the answers. No, you know no. what I mean? Like you watch it a documentary you that's more sort of direct, and you think, well, you're not telling me this certain thing, like yeah. certain things. And this sort of allows you to sort of imagine at the same time as giving you like the information and like this slow delivery that that doesn't sort of overwhelm. You know what I mean? It's it's yeah, I was really impressed with it. So let's talk a bit about the box. People love people talking about boxes on YouTube, don't they? <laughs> Unboxing Do they? it. There you go. Can you hear that? And, and by box, he means the the Blu-ray cover. Yes. Yes. <laughs> It's a really stunning design, and I, I know that the Big Cartel do a real nice job with these Blu-rays, but the kind of level of detail in a little booklet, which is very personal, I don't know why I'm opening it up live. But, You're going through it. But yeah, it's just, it tells you a bit about where Tom, kind of his interests come from, and also the fact that he has, that these stories have been in his life for a long time, things that his grandma would tell him, you know? And also what I think is really cool about this Blu-ray, I'm definitely going to take an opportunity to watch the other version, there's another version of it, which is a silent film, without the narration. And yeah, like, I'd love to see it with just that, that in mind. We just take in the visuals, because the story does that nonetheless. You can follow that narrative with just being told, this is the information, this is the information. And it would hark back to that Hexon, that Hexon kind of vibe, you know? Mm. Well, I think that's the thing, is that the, the film sort of works as a, as a, a silent film at the same time. And uh, especially with certain things like the... Uh, the, the graphics that came up of the phone ringing, um, yeah, where, yeah, yeah, just that like almost comic booky moment that was thrown in there that didn't feel out of place in the slightest, but sort of added this like level of of lightness of like uh, you know acknowledging that you're watching a film um, and it's a recreation without doing it too directly. I think it's a, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I suppose if you think if you wanted to go into detail of it, that kind of is um, an in depth or a slightly in-depth look at like Tom's mindset because if he's been brought up I'd imagine his gran was probably living through the time period because it was in the 40s wasn't it so she mm. would have like probably bared witness to the stories as they were happening and then for that to then be like throughout Tom's life as he's growing up whenever you have something like that I suppose it becomes normal almost normal so you do have your everyday life things happening so there is comedy within everyday life while there is seriousness. So to add that into the um, the actual show itself or the, the film itself, um, I think that was kind of cool. And it, mm. yeah, it, it, it worked. Yeah. So we, we recommend the film to people. Yeah. Then, yeah? yeah, strongly, yeah. Awesome. So guys, we wanted to introduce to you a brand new section within our podcast, which we like to call Scenes We Love. And the idea behind it is uh, every few weeks or every week, um, one of us will pick a scene and then we like to sort of analyse that scene and uh, basically talk about what we loved about it and what makes it special for us individually and then discuss it amongst ourselves and uh, kind of understand other scenes or how certain scenes or films may have influenced the scenes that we've selected. I realise I've said scenes a lot, so I'm going to move on. And um, this week we're going to discuss Children of Men. Um, so the thing that stands out for me about this film, well actually nothing really stands out about the film because at the time I didn't really like it. <laughs> um, but I, I always remember being 14 years old when this film, film came out and um, the particular uh, tracking shot and it's the long tick the third one towards the end of the film and it's in the middle of a you know kind of unrest civil war going on it's what you can imagine like Gaza being like these yeah. days can we link that YouTube video in the, in the yeah probably yeah. cool cool um, so yeah the link will be in the description if you want to check it out but basically yeah it's just turmoil um, the premise of the film is you've got the, the British government um, you've got militant sort of rebel group uh, that are uprising against them but the idea is that no one can get pregnant. No, there hasn't been any pregnancies for the last 18 years. Um, and Theo, who's played by Clive Owen, has come into contact with a woman called Kay, um, who is pregnant. And he takes it upon himself to look after her and try and protect her. And, you know, he, he joins the, or uses the rebels' help, the militant group's help. But then it turns out that they've got their own agenda. So he's kind of on his own trying to protect her. And this particular scene is um, the rebel group and the, the their leader, Luke, effectively 
kidnaps Key, and she's she's had the baby at this point. And the the tracking shot just follows them through this war zone, and but in particular Clive Owen, and his mission to basically cat well free her, get her from uh, Luke's capture, and the way that it, it kind of takes you through this worn torn um, world or you know area location, I just think was absolutely fascinating. The the visuals, the way that they even pull off some sort of I, I imagine they did it in post, but the the CGI and the the um, the gunshots, yeah, and mm. just to get everyone in sync, because I imagine that would have taken countless amount of takes. Mm. And you know, it's not just a tracking shot that's like one two minutes long; it's six and a half minutes. So yeah, six and a half minutes. It goes all the way through a building, and you see. I mean, there are moments in there that are clearly, uh, you know, you can put cuts in there because you're you're focusing on a wall or something like that. There's ways to get around that kind of thing. But nonetheless, the skill to actually pull that off is is still like phenomenal. And, and the way that the scene sort of captivates you and, and keeps you in that moment, feeling like you're really seeing it, yeah, yeah. you know, feeling like it's, it's real footage that's being captured. You know, the, 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 the cameraman is there in some ways and they, they are, they're almost like a journalist, we were saying, while yeah. watching the scene. And, uh, you know, they're trying to capture all these moments at the side so you see all these... Uh, people who've who are mourning uh, loved ones that have died and been shot or, or you know killed in other some some other capacity of seeing sort of you know people dying there and it's it's, it's really frantic. powerful and yeah, yeah it, it, but it's frantic but it's not frantic in the way where it's like you know like if you get fine footage handheld recorded it's mm. if you think of Cloverfield for example it's very like um, all over the place and erratic yeah. whereas this is like controlled oh get like information taken yeah. that's happening over there crap oh we're running now oh okay and, and exceptionally well paced as well yeah, yeah yeah exactly you know it's sometimes well Clive Owen's character he'll look in a direction and the camera will show you around then yeah. by that point it's returned to him the whole scenario has kind of changed a little bit there's one particular bit where the tank just suddenly appears and you, you know there's something coming because you're running around by the time the camera spun around the whole yeah it's just elevated to more of a chaotic sequence but it, it gradually goes up in um elements of risk doesn't it mm, yeah. and you feel that tension especially like when you see that tank you're thinking oh crap the next thing the, the next bad thing is about to happen and as he gets closer to the building there's another tank that's already there that blows out a proportion of the building it's never forced though because uh, modern filmmaking does that kind of thing where it takes you on a roller coaster computer game sense but because it's more measured mm. you genuinely for a moment you get this gut punch feeling where you feel like yeah, this is what it must feel like when you're in a war zone. Yeah, and, and, and really... the thing is, he's not—he's not a combatant. He's not fighting. He's yeah. just trying he's to get civilian. through it. He's yeah, trying yeah. To, and you're seeing all these other civilians that are, are fleeing. You see mostly civilians during that, and and those are the people that are really the people that suffer from war. And that's what that that film captures and shows so well. Yeah, yeah. Is that, you know, yeah, you you've got dead combatants on either side, but it's the civilians who've done nothing that are just in the midst that are getting torn apart. Um, and I, the, I wanted to mention just about the music in that scene because if Very you noticed horror, it, yeah. it really like um, it continuously just built up this kind of like almost horror esque kind Definitely. of uh, uh, element to it. Um, and there was no payoff. There was no musical payoff in that. It, and I know what the you know the next scene that comes after yeah. is um, with the, with the ceasefire and them being you know All allowed to the walk baby. out and yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, like that sort of that sort of power of, of building it, building it with no sort of musical sort of big moment mm. to pay off, a big heroic kind I think of. Yeah. <clears throat> that works though because oh, totally. if you think of other tracking shots, they kind of fill the the space with a musical score, and it, that kind of sets the pace or whatever of that particular tracking shot. Mm. Whereas this, you're meant to be taken in by the elements and the experience of what's going on around yeah. and within the scene, especially with the way, that, like you said, Sam, that it, it sort of changes, well, I think you said it, Jack, it changes the angles and sort of looks at where Clive Owen's looking, and um, yeah. it kind of keeps you there in the environment. And like mm. even the bit where he, he gets up to the building, 
and the civilians come out and again it just shows the tragedy of war and you know uh, civil war uh, like especially when the civilians come out and they got their white flags and everything they just get gunned down mm. and it's like then he runs past that and you're like crap <laughs> yeah. I think that's the thing the visceralness of it like they really want you to feel like you're there hence why there's literally blood on the screen yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the thing is it doesn't feel cheap it mm. like again it brings you back to this like fucking reporter and a journalist trying to get through a war zone it achieves it really well and yeah. I mean obviously with that the, the cinematographer Emmanuel Lewitsky his whole thing is to do the most perfect <laughs> like tracking shots possible yeah I kind of, I might be wrong, but I feel like Children of Men was the beginning point of when at least bigger cinema was more aware of his tracking shots. Mm. Because obviously The Revenant, Birdman in particular, of course, even um, Gravity, these are beautiful continuous shots that are so controlled, but never to the point where it feels manufactured. Yeah. And he's so good at doing that. Yeah. Definitely. And I think um, on your point of being in the scene, I, I noticed as well, you, you spend more of your time on the back of Clive Owen's head than you do on, in front on, of him. on his face. Yeah. And that's sort of like rare for a scene like that. You're not focusing on, on the person trying to get through the individual. You're seeing the scene as it, as it is. You're sort of like, uh, I don't know, feeling, feeling more than just like connected to that, that character. Again, it's that it's that journalist feel, isn't it? You wouldn't mm. be in front of a journalist as they're running yeah. through a thing. You know, the, the cameraman it feels like another character that's there. Yeah. But you, you, you could say like the cameraman could be ahead, and at times whenever the cameraman does get ahead, it's almost it brings it back like, oh, you still with me? Mm. Like whenever the cameraman gets into the building first, or at least to the entrance of the building, then it cuts round to Clive Owen and he jumps the wall, and then it follows mm. him in. Yeah, yeah. And um, but as well to sort of reinforce that point. That you're on this journey with Clive Owen, and um, Theo, his character, um, it's 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 kind of interesting that you see the group that he's with initially. So you've got the key with her baby. She's being pushed around in a wheelchair. But you've two other civilians, and one of them gets quickly like taken out, shot whenever they get captured, and then Key gets taken. Okay, sorry, gets taken. Um, yeah, and then the woman that he that sort of takes over to the little tunnel and they're hiding away from the tank and the, the armed forces coming, he basically tells her to stay there. So it's almost like everyone's getting picked off but the reporter and him. It's like, it, it adds extra tension to that. It's like, when are you, like when is the, the cameraman effectively going to get taken out? Yeah, when yeah. is Clive Owen going to get taken out? You never really feel like he's going to be the victor in this like the odds are stacked against them yeah. it's, it's interesting you feel that, that film because like there's a couple of brilliant continuous shots and personally the one I, I like the one I connect with the most is the one inside the car is that how oh, Julian Moore gets shot yeah because yeah. the whole tone of the film completely changes within a second they're all loving and like laughing and having a bit of a joke in the car and then boom she's shot and it's that continuous thing you're stuck in that smaller environment mm. and it just gives you this this feeling of oh, okay this film is you're there mm. you're there with the action and it's such a brilliant way to do it yeah. and yeah fully to get explored and being like right you've seen it from a small thing inside a car of how this switches from a normal life into a gun shooting situation to here's the bigger picture here's the fucking war zone yeah. and because it's UK based as well yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah, horrible it's feeling hard. of this could happen one day. And I, I, that's why the film works so well. I don't know where they shot it. Like if they actually had a, a set location and they built up the sort of catastrophe or if they actually built it from scratch. But even just um, attention to detail. So yeah. in the UK, we have these like things on walls and um, they're li like little signs. They're hitches, the mm -hmm. yellow hitches. And whenever he runs to one of the walls and hides behind it, there's a hitch there and it's like... Oh yeah, you'd notice that if you were living in Britain, but yeah. to the to the untrained eye or someone who didn't live in Britain wouldn't necessarily like associate something like that. I just think yeah. that is really like cool. Yeah, I think the the attention to detail throughout that scene is incredible because you think like this isn't this isn't just one room that they've had to set dress. This is yeah, an entire yeah. journey, an yeah. entire sort of setup of everything, every little element. Oh, like even actors, though like the running extras. through that sort of bus bit where they uh, was it a bus or a van that they yeah, ran he runs through, through a bus to, out the side. Um, and you just see out the window on one side of like all these people and oh, just so much going. But even There's like so the explosions and scene. stuff, because mm. you imagine you know you're running through a tick, and then um, yeah, it got messed up because someone missed their cue or whatever. Mm. You have to like reinstall glass, 
and yeah. like reinstall the rubble and mm. I imagine there was probably a good couple of takes yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. absolutely no, I guess one takes perfectly well no, yeah can you no. imagine if they rehearsed that so many times and then they go <laughs> to do it and if they mess it up like that would be but um, uh, the other point I was going to make about the about the scene is despite the heaviness and the and the serious subject matter you've got that like brief moment of of comedy where he runs across and uh, as he's you know as trying to dodge these bullets jumps and, and knocks into a few people who are <laughs> hidden next to him and goes oh sorry sorry like that and gets up and carries on and it's just such a moment of sort of like normal human behavior in this sort of scene of chaos like yeah, this yeah. this little sort of glimpse of order that is just funny in that, like, in that moment that's what i said to you jack it's like oh at least he's still got manners yeah. like, <laughs> i just yeah I, I, I whenever i was 14 and i watched that th th there was nothing really else that stood out to me about the film like i, I thought that I think you should probably rewatch it probably not in <laughs> my mindset these days yeah i'd actually really enjoy it but I've never really been a massive fan of Clive Owen. I think like his acting comes across as a bit stale sometimes, so I couldn't invest in his character so much. Um, and I, yeah, I just didn't think the story was executed. Like the, the, the idea of the story is really cool, the concept of it, but the way that it was executed was a little bit iffy for me. But the tracking shot within that always stood out for me. I can think of other tracking shots, but they don't ring as true as what this one does. And just the carnage, the chaos, the, the, the way everyone had to hit their marks, the cues. And then the kind of, I know you said with the music, there's no climax. Um, but I think the climax within the actual on screen is when they do make that first cut and then they do have the ceasefire. So cut in terms of mm. they end the tracking shot. I think that moment where they're just walking through the building and leaving it and you know, you've got British soldiers and the rebels and civilians that was just brilliant like that's yeah yeah but I, I like the fact there's no musical payoff because you build up that climax and then and then the threat of tension is still kind of there even though the piece is there because you're surrounded by soldiers and guns still it's and still rubble quite, and yeah it's still quite a scary just, scenario and I think the, the payoff and the music cue is almost through the baby because everyone's like in awe. It's been mm. eighteen years since someone had a baby. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's the first time anyone in eighteen years has seen a, like a baby. And of course, the end of that shot is that sort of uh, you know the um, the scene, the shot that we're talking about is the baby's crying, and it yeah. sort of draws you up the stairs as you and you know as he follows it to try and find this baby. And obviously, you know, it's such a uh, an important aspect to the film that there this is the first baby for eighteen years. You yeah, know? Um, yeah powerful so guys we hope that you enjoyed this week's podcast as ever leave us a like leave a comment uh, leave a comment as well if there's any sort of um scenes that you think that we should talk about or uh, even if you just want to tell us a scene your favorite scene that'd be cool um subscribe as ever and uh yeah keep up to date with everything trash arts other than that trash arts take out Bye. Ta -da. <clears throat> what was that like 15